critical theory at the point we find it um, is is really experiencing a bit of a crisis. Um, I have a slide for you that says something like that. It's experiencing a crisis of purpose. It's a quote off page 11 in the Bronner text. Um, that, that crisis revolves around um, a, a common phenomena we see uh, with, with research and theory and philosophy issues. And it really um, relates to the movement of this uh, this thing called critical theory uh, into the university uh, system per se. Uh, it's, it's difficult for us to remember that so many of these things that we study as theory really began on the ground as it were. Uh, these ideas began as uh, individuals with great passion, with great purpose, set about to solve real problems for real people's lives. And so was the case with the, the original critical theorists. Uh, the men whose names uh, we looked at uh, at the end of chapter one. Uh, these, were, these were men who were reacting to uh, a tragedy in Europe, in the world. Uh, the Holocaust, the murder of nearly six million Jews by Hitler and his soldiers. Uh, and, and in looking at this, this, this horrid human tragedy, uh, these men began to outline um, practical ways that we could prevent this from happening again. They were reacting to the horrible moral and ethical um, realities that, that human governance and human systems under the guise of scientific rationalism uh, had ultimately murdered millions and millions of people. Um, and, and in this practical quest, uh, the, the challenging and the questioning of human society and human order, uh, these early critical theorists really were exchanging papers and ideas and thoughts and discussions that had a very practical point to them. Uh, they, they were trying to to prevent these tragedies from happening again. They were trying to create social systems that protected the individual freedom of individuals uh, while encouraging good social order uh, in, in the community. And so now we find ourselves where these grand questions of critical theory, where the grand discussions of critical theory uh, have become the property of philosophers and intellectuals and academicians who are uh, working in universities. Um, these have become the, the, uh, the, um, the discussion and the, the artifacts that describe intellectual life. And these are disconnected from the real problems that real people face anymore. Um, Bronner says that the activist impulse of critical theory, the impulse to fix a problem, um, has given away to something more like a philosophical affirmation of subjectivity. And so we, we have the problem of these totally administered societies, uh, and while uh, professors and theorists sit around discussing and writing about it, we don't always find people who are actively engaging to change those societies. So this is a problem and a reality that we're going to come back to over and over again in this course. Um, but now for the rest of this video, we want to turn our attention back into history again and look at some key individuals whose writings and whose work um, sort of anticipate um, where critical theory will emerge uh, later in the 1940s. Um, so we're going to go way back into the 17 and 1800s for just a few minutes uh, and talk about, uh, first of all, Immanuel Kant. Uh, and then we will move through Feicht and then on to Hegel uh, and bring this short discussion to a close. Um, Immanuel Kant, um, the um, philosopher who lived in uh, the mid to early 1700s, he died in the early 1800s, 1804. He's a German philosopher. So many of the people we're going to encounter this semester are Germans. Uh, very large and, and uh, influential philosophical history uh, in Germany. Kant's primary contribution, you have slides for this, was to reject pure reason as the basis for knowledge. 
Think about the context of the world. We've gone through the Enlightenment period. We've, we've gone through a period of time where uh, humanity is rejecting outside transcendent knowledge that comes to us. Um, and we, we have a group of people who are, are exalting reason, if you will, that by thinking, by using our intellectual powers of observation, we can obtain an understanding of the world. And Kant rejects the notion that pure reason alone uh, is the basis for knowledge. Kant asserts for us that personal experience, subjective experiences, uh, can also serve as a basis for knowledge. Um, so, philosophically, Kant is the father of existentialism. He is, uh, in some ways, we would say the father of what we now call qualitative research or subjective or existential or narrative research. Um, he lays the ideas that we create knowledge ourselves through personal subjective experiences or existentialism. The key quote on page 13 of the text, this realm of possible experience must therefore call forth a variant of reason that differs qualitatively from scientific rationality. And so Kant gives us this dichotomy between quantitative scientific reasoning and a more qualitative existential reasoning, knowledge through personal experience. So for Kant, uh, and I summarize these as, as separate little points in, in the slide, for Kant, the individual is critical to the idea that knowledge can be acquired through personal experience. I, I've given you a chart, that handout one, and I directed you to print handout one. We call that the Kantian quadrant, and we're going to talk about that box all the way through the course. Make a dozen copies of it, put them in a, in a binder, uh, and, and we'll just keep coming back to this Kantian box. Um, uh, Kant has taken the left side of that box, nature and object, uh, that, that is the side of, of the, uh, the universe or a, a way of looking at the universe that objectifies a, a reality. Uh, and the methods associated to that left side of that box, um, those are the methods of scientific positivism and rationalism. Um, the use of pure reason and pure observation. Um, and Kant says that while that may be valid, Maybe we have. To, it depends on which of Kant's writings you read. Um, Kant is really going to uh, endorse or prioritize the right side boxes there. That the individual having personal experience, the subject, the knower, is a more uh, significant source or, f or or vector for knowledge acquisition. The, this becomes subjective knowledge, of course, but for Kant that becomes primary. Uh, this form of knowledge requires both a subject and an object that are independent each, uh, of each other. If you look at that, uh, the bottom two boxes there, we've got the subject on one side and an object on the other side. For Kant, there has to be a subject and for the subject to know something, well, that thing is the object. And these are independent of each other and that independence equals freedom. The subject is free to interpret uh, his or her observations based on her own experiences. That doesn't presuppose anything or change the nature of that object on the other side. The object is in fact objective, separate, distinct from the knower. It has its own uh, immutable sort of properties that don't change. Uh, they have relationship this object and subject, but they are free from each other. You cannot have impressions of an objective world without a knowing subject. Think about that. right? The fact that we know anything, that knowledge presupposes that there is a someone who knows, that the individual, the knower, is there. And for Kant, freedom alone differentiates the subject from the object. If we lose that freedom, if these, the knower and the known merge, there is no possibility of freedom.
we will come back to this and to Kant in just a few minutes. Uh, we will regularly visit Kant's idea of freedom as we go through this semester. Let's turn to a second person who shows up in Chapter 2, J.G. Feicht. Um, and Feicht will be referenced by many or most of the, the writers that we look at in subsequent chapters of this book. Feicht contributes to this discussion we've been having about Kant's quadrant, uh, the idea of an idealized absolute subject that stands in opposition to nature. Feicht is talking about the top two boxes in your Kantian quadrant. He's talking about nature with a capital N, which is different from an individual object. He's talking about all of nature, this meta-nature, if you will. Yes, this is a very abstract philosophical course. And Feicht says that there's a counterpart, just like there is the entire grand universe together. There is also a subject. There is some grand mind or purpose or meta-narrative that idealizes individuality. It is the grand mind or thought or spirit, the Germans would say, of the universe. Now, don't confuse Feich's conversation with God or some other theistic being here. Uh, he's talking in abstract uh, metaphysical terms. Um, Feich views the idealized subject, the top right box, uh, as ego in the sense that Freud used the word ego. But Feich saw this only as theory. A quote from page 17, the freedom of the subject, the lower right box, the freedom of that subject can never be fully actualized since it never is but eternally ought to be. For fight, the individual, you or me, we can't fully find meaning in our life because we are not connected perfectly to that big picture. We don't have a full mental awareness of all that is knowable, uh, and, and we are separated or biased, if you will, in our perceptions of reality. Uh, continuing, freedom, therefore, becomes a function of the absolute, and the striving to attain freedom is doomed to remain incomplete because we are finite human beings we will never uh, in fact be fully free in our lives fight in that reinforces the classical dualism nature versus person uh, but he does it in idealized terms fight further contributes uh, just a couple of other things and then we'll move on to hegel um, Feig has a couple of other key thoughts, page 18 in the textbook there. Uh, the recovery from alienation. All right, pause. Alienation is the breakdown, uh, the, the divorce between nature and the person, between the object and the self, between the knower, the individual, the bottom right box, and the known, the bottom left box. This breakdown, separation, whether we call it imperfect knowledge, whether we call it bias, uh, whether we call it a lack of discovery of all of the pieces of the universe, whatever this alienation looks like, it can the, the recovery from that can only occur through the conscious action of a subject with an interest in freedom. The object doesn't act. It is the subject that must act, or who must act. So Kant's categorical imperative, the ethic of a will to do good or to seek peace, um, uh, to that idea that Kant gives us, Feicht develops the categorical imperative to revolution. And we'll get to revolution a little bit later in the course. Uh, but uh, Feicht would say to us that the individual is in a constant state of revolution, fighting back, pushing back against the objective systems of the universe that would crowd out the space of the individual to interpret, to assign meaning his or herself. Lastly, Feicht then reinforces the value of freedom. The importance of seeking freedom of self against the power of necessity in nature. The, there are outside forces for Feicht 
uh, and we call this nature, that are constraining against my free will. And so the free subject of the individual is situated against a controlling object in a dualism. This dualism, uh, we'll, we will eventually use the word dialectic uh, to talk about the relationship between the subject and object. But this is where this emerges with Kant talking about this absolute nature versus subjective experience and then Feicht giving us the added dimension of a conflict between these two things. Now, I'm going to cut this video off here uh, because I have a great deal to say about Hegel and I'd rather not make these videos too long. So we'll stop here. We'll pick up the next discussion with Hegel.